Yes, we're all fucked. <laughs> that was Daryl West agreeing with me. He's the VP of Governance and Director at the Brookings Institution in Washington, DC. You might be wondering why on earth we were being so negative. Why weren't we being more optimistic? We were talking about AI. We were talking about machine learning. We were talking about all of the amazing changes that are happening in technology today and how they will be impacting us. I have been fascinated in the role of technology and human advancement and uh, the organizational changes in the environment ever since, let me think now, 1989, <laughs> when I was at college doing my organization in the environment. And at that time, I was very much focused on looking at what changes were happening and how things were going. I then moved to work for a very small company called Sony, working on the PlayStation launch uh, back in 1995. And at that time, again, I was able to witness firsthand how rapidly everything was evolving and how exciting it was. So now we're in a situation where things are very, very different. We now have a situation whereby we are no longer in the environment whereby we've gone from email through to the internet, through to uh, the mobile technology. We're now talking about AI, where the robots are coming. Really, it is the new electricity. This is how it's been described, and it's the most exciting thing. But basically what that means is that things are going to be changing significantly. And when things change significantly, we know that we also need to change significantly with it. AI is going to be seen as a phenomenal opportunity for so many industries, for so many people, but it also is going to be quite damaging to a lot of others. The Go World Champion Lisa Doll retired in the face of AI. He was uh, very, very focused on being the champion of the world of, of the Go World game, uh, and Google had created an AI algorithm which enabled him to, which enabled them to actually beat him. He now considers himself out of a job. So rewinding back again to 1989, there were the heady days of being the first people in the world to have a computer that was absolutely gigantic, of CD players and all of those wonderful things. And this was just before email, before the internet that came of things, came about. And we were hearing about this amazing new ideal called the information superhighway. Does anybody remember that? <laughs> so there was a really big opportunity there. Email came along and you know, the rest is history. But this time it is different. IDC has reported that this year alone in 2019, $37.5 billion has been spent on AI globally and it's gonna be doubling year on year, I believe. According to Brookings, we mentioned uh, Daryl West at the Brookings Institution just earlier. He, in particular, his organization publishes various articles, and there's one that actually states white-collar workers are going to be losing their jobs due to AI. It's going to be a really challenging time. So I want to be able to give everybody the opportunity to just sit for a second and think about how this is going to affect you, your colleagues, your teams, your bosses, the people that report to you, your family, your friends, your neighbors, and all of these different people that are in the environment with you. And how, how that's going to, how AI and the machine learning age, et cetera, is going to actually be impacting you. And then next, I'd like to invite you to consider how AI is going to impact and improve your work environment. And then I'd like you to actually think about how you need to adapt in this new environment. But I have really good news. I'll just let you know right now. According to Charles Darwin, 19th century guy, we are all able to adapt. Isn't that great? I knew you'd love that. And it's the people that are able to adapt who are most likely to be able to survive and thrive. And he, little do people know that he was one of the very first founders of emotional intelligence. Of course, they didn't call it that back in that day. Uh, he, but he was the godfather, if I can call it, of being able to research or researchers actually focusing on emotional behaviors, which I only found out quite recently when discussing this. 
So the good thing is that we all have emotional intelligence. Every single one of us, even the people that you think don't have emotional intelligence, they have <laughs> emotional intelligence. And what's really going to be important for us is that we advance as much as we can and to have a learning mindset uh, very much on how we can adapt, how we can be curious, how we can listen, how we can learn, what we can do to actually make this change. And you have a decision to make right now, and it's, 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 it's going to be a hard one to be able to make because it is pretty binary, it's yes or no, but you have the opportunity right now to make a decision. Do I want to learn to evolve in this uh, environment or do I not want to? Either, either way, you have made a decision uh, to progress forward and to, and to make yourself successful within this environment. But I also have some more good news. It's not just you that needs to adapt, organizations need to adapt. And this is the cornerstone of the work that I do, as well as the coaching work that I do, which is that we live in a world of chaotic organizations that, go, that create this very merry dance, um, which I'm sure you're all aware of and have experienced it, or you've heard about it, or read about it, or seen news flashes about it. And it goes something like this. Hire, fire, hire again, and then lay off. And it takes that dance, that dance keeps coming, it could happen every two years, it could happen every five years, and it's whenever there's new technology that comes in. And when that happens, how disruptive is that for you and everybody else, your family, your friends, your neighbors, etc. and then being able to find work? And that dance that is created is hugely disruptive to organizations and the people that are, that are there because they're not planning ahead. What I would like to see is a brand new paradigm which is an emotionally intelligent organization. An emotionally intelligent organization understands what is necessary to be able to advance in the AI age and is able to think very strategically with great thought, with great empathy, with great decision-making skills about where they need to go, how they're going to get there and include their people on the ride. Because one of the fundamental beliefs that I have, and I'm gonna read this straight out, is that without insight, support, or guidance on the behaviors that organizations currently have, it will put strain and stress on the people running the organization, which impacts the company's productivity, culture, employer brand, profitability, and employee happiness, which then impacts the way the customers and clients work with you. So you have that glorious, or what should I say, not so glorious, vicious cycle. And these are what I call the elephants in the room where organizations will go through this never-ending cycle time and time again uh, without just stopping and taking that moment to, to identify exactly what the issue is or the issues are and to be able to move forward in that particular way. So I wanna check in and have a, have a moment here to be able to identify where you are on this, this scale uh, because our emotions are really important. There's gonna be some people here in this room that are gonna be thinking, oh no, the AI age will never happen to me, or oh, that, that's something well, you know, I don't need to worry about, thank you very much. I'm sure there's a couple in the room thinking that right now. Well, I have amazing news for you. Welcome to Planet Denial. <laughs> <laughs> this is a situation that we find ourselves in uh, with all sorts of environments or all sorts of situations in our lives whereby we are unable to handle the change that happens. And you know, so I, I very much see that this is okay. If you have that sensation, if you have that feeling and that impulse, that is okay. That is your brain protecting itself from actually wanting to, to make that very painful change. You know, when you can feel that you're learning something new, that is painful change for your brain. So start getting used to it, start enjoying it, start relishing it, even if it is hard to deal with it. So one of the ways to shorten that entire process is to be able to become immediately curious and to start talking about the possibilities so you can normalize things swiftly and then you're able to move on. So let's talk about the emotional intelligent organization. So moving on from an internal lens and looking at the external lens. We are all people leaders, not just leaders. We're all people leaders. And what do I mean by that? We are all mini activists in our organizations and in life. You know, even when we go on the subway, we are mini activists on how we're able to behave and work with others and communicate with others. And I believe very strongly that we are able to do that as well within an organization. 
What I would like to see from the people leaders in an organization is that they are able to seek out AI solutions with the team in the organization, be open to change, move, it, move everything forward in the best possible way. The next aspect that I'd like to be able to talk about is the war for talent. The war for talent is very real and it's been getting worse and worse. Even now with uh, AI, technical engineering, analytics, finance, creative and production roles are going to be even harder to find. If you focus on the, the dance that we talked about earlier of the hire, fire, layoff and so on, you're in this situation whereby you're not allowing the people to actually become engaged within an organization fast enough. So when you've got this, this, this barren wasteland of talent that have these really rare, hard to find skills that I call unicorns, what do you need to do? I strongly believe, and I'm, I, this is a pretty radical idea here that I'm throwing out to you because I don't often hear of organizations doing it, which is that organizations take up the great, hairy, audacious opportunity to reskill or upskill their people at 10 times speed. I know, isn't that crazy? <laughs> Who would think about that? Because this is the scenario right now. You lay off the people. It takes six months to go through that process. You're, you're identifying in the organization from a senior level, who are you going to lay off? In that time when you're laying those people off, those people are committed. The majority, not all. There's a, usually a very high disengagement level within an organization. But it's up to the organization to understand who really wants to move forward. So this is where the mini activists in the organization can really rise up. So you've got the six-month situation where an organization is laying people off. Then there's six to 12 months to actually search for those magical unicorns in the creative, analytical, finance, whatever it is, environment, to try and find those people that will become a culture fit, only to then find that they are hard to find because guess what? Everyone else is searching for them as well. <laughs> Spoiler. Uh, <laughs> and that's the reality. It's a really tough, incredibly competitive market. So then you hire this amazing unicorn. You've got this person on. Maybe they're not your first choice. Maybe they're not your second choice, but you're filling that seat. They take six to 18 months to ramp up and actually develop their ability to you know, be productive. That's 24 months, maybe a little bit more depending. You know, I don't know whose maths is going to be really good here in this room. But you've got this situation whereby that's 24 months to get to that situation. How much faster would it have been if you had trained the people up or upskilled the people with those high, the high potential people to that particular position? What would have happened then? I believe upskilling is an emotionally intelligent thing to do for organizations. And what else? Have you considered that an employer brand is actually part of emotional intelligence? Yes, indeed. Do you think it's all about smiley faces and you know, on social media and, and, and uh, foosball tables. No, it is not. No, it is not. I strongly believe an emotionally intelligent organization and focusing on the brand side of things is whether they are able to meet a talent's aspirations and expectations in the environment. And what do I mean by that? When you're bringing somebody on that really is driven to move your company forward, they're going to have a far more incredible range of beliefs and values and understandings and experiences than the people that you currently have in the organization. So that means you need to upskill that organization. You need to uptrend that, that, that organization. You need to ensure that everyone is rising to that level that you want people to join with you. So that means evolving your culture as fast as candidate expectations do in the realms of purpose, decision making, interpersonal relationships, stress, management, inclusivity, and leadership. So what exactly is an emotionally intelligent organization? An emotionally intelligent organization knows that its behaviors form its culture. Its culture impacts its product, its corporate brand, its employer brand, and its employee experience. An emotionally intelligent organization is a place where everyone is a mini activist for managing their agreed upon culture to inspire a virtuous employee and organizational journey. It's my belief that we are in this situation where we have to make these dramatic changes to ensure that organizations, our countries, our economy is able to thrive. As my coach once said to me, if nothing changes, nothing changes.
Thank you.